Hello, it's CJ Kim again, hosting the podcast by myself for the second week in uh, in a row. I have a very special guest on again today, um, Mark Henderson, the CEO and president of Laramide Resources. Mark has a, a very interesting background and I guess one of the uh, the mainstays on the, the Bay Street mining scene. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you, CJ. It's a very charitable introduction. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, Mark, can you give us, uh, you know, uh, a brief on uh, your background and how you got to where you are today? Sure. I've been involved for many years now in what, you know, people consider, I guess, junior mining, really development stage companies that uh, are involved kind of in the layer, uh, the layer of development below when production companies come in typically and take things over. We're typically looking for, you know, large scale um, plays that are of interest to majors. Uh, that's kind of been our MO is sort of uh, being able to get things that that typically have had worked on them in, in the past by large development companies, sometimes forgotten about for one reason or another. Sometimes commodity cycles that come and go, and people forget about things. The majors tend to have fantastic inventories of things, and that's kind of been our uh, mo over the years. And we've been quite successful at it in a number of plays, probably most particularly uh, deal you may have heard about from ten years ago or more called Aqualine down in uh, Argentina, South America, that was. Uh, had sort of a little bit of everything involved in it, a big silver discovery that became kind of the biggest undeveloped silver thing on the planet, a lawsuit, and ultimately yeah. a takeout by Pan American Silver for, uh, I guess, about $650 million. Yeah. So, so if you, that was kind of a win, I guess, if you want to call it, uh, if you want to put it in that ledger. And so we've, we've had this other company that we're here, here today to talk about a little bit uh, in the uranium space the entire time. Like I've been in that space now for, you know, over 15 years because that's a cycle that has uh, – you know, it's taken a long, long time to get to where it is today. We obviously had a huge intervening period of time that people know about post Fukushima, but nuclear power is back. So yeah, well, let, let's timely. talk a, a little bit about Aqualine because you mentioned that it had a little bit of all the the flavors that make junior a junior mining company so exciting. And when you talk to a lot of uh, the people that have been in the space for a while, Aqualine is a company that comes up where. You know, a lot of people say it's been a, a big win in in their portfolio. So, how did how did that come about? And can you talk about a little bit of uh, the the heartaches and uh, the speed bumps that you, um, that you hit in running that company, and how you how you were ultimately able to sell that? Sure. Yeah. Well, we we uh, you know we always like gold. I've been involved in a bunch of different gold deals over the years, and uh, gold went through a very difficult. Um, bear market period of time as well. But, you know, many of your kind of listeners won't remember this, but uh, there was a famous company in Canada called Briex um, that talked about having an immense amount of gold in Indonesia that turned out to be all made up. Uh, and that really was a setback for the market uh, from about 96, 97, all the way into the early 2000s. And then, of course, we had a, we had a, a huge thematic bubble around the internet Mm -hmm. uh, and dot com and all the rest of it that that people may be familiar with, uh, you know, that resulted in some fantastic Super Bowl ads and not that many companies came mm -hmm. out of it. And gold finally started coming around again when that boom faded in the early 2000s. And we went uh, and made a conscientious effort to try and get into the gold business by, uh, you know, participating in various auctions to try and buy gold assets. And we were successful ultimately buying one from Newmont. And so we bought, basically we bought a a company that was Newmont Argentina, and it came with a, a, a partially developed gold mine. But what was more interesting is it came with an enormous database, mm -hmm. and it was in that database that was the genesis of this uh, Navidad silver discovery. And it turned out other people had had similar ideas, and but had signed CAs and then not bid on the asset, and then surreptitiously gone around and picked the eyes out of the database. And effectively, we became the so kind of the defining the, yeah. case. Sorry to interrupt, but we became yeah. kind of the defining case on. What you know? What's defensible in a CA? And we actually, you know, took that court case through multi levels of Canadian courts and 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 won the day on the whole thing. Yeah. So during the bidding process, um, people who were interested in this project all signed a CA to get into the data room, and you went through it. The I guess the correct way, where you went through the bidding process, knowing that you were going to acquire this gold asset, but there were other, I guess, non core assets that came or potential like prospective uh, areas of this project that could yield something like this silver discovery that you made, but other people kind of went around it and went down there and staked this area or 
How, how did they get a hold of them? Yeah, someone yeah. staked it. I mean, I, I can't recall how many people, you know, had a look yeah. at the data. Ultimately, yeah. I believe there were five or six bidders. Yeah. We were the successful bidder. You know, we were primarily bidding for an asset that we could put a divine value on and we thought would grow. And, yeah. and you know, really, it was kind of a, a nice surprise. But um, Newmont didn't own the project that they staked. They staked it outright themselves. Well, they, they had done an enormous amount of data collection. And that's kind of an interesting thing if you're in the global resource businesses, again, back to this thematic about majors, Yeah, is the majors do an awful lot of generative work that for one reason or another sometimes doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, and they'll do all the baseline uh, geochem and other various, you know, the geophysics and other various forms of, of early stage things prior to drilling anything. And all that data, you know, is available, but it's proprietary to, to the company that did the, did the production of the data. Mm-hmm. And so there, you know, this is often the case in discovery, you know, the, the success has many, many fathers in, in mineral discovery. And it's often the third or fourth mouse that gets the cheese, if you will. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the case, the case here. They had basically staked the bullseye silver anomaly, probably the greatest geochemical silver anomaly you'll ever see in your lifetime and never acted on it. So they had, I, I guess, the, the main meat of it, but... I, the, the other issuers kind of took the uh, the periphery or there is prospectivity because Newmont did the work outside of the area that they were actually selling. Yes, they had that. They, uh, but in, in reviewing the data set, you could yeah. look at the entirety of the data set. And mm-hmm. if you basically, you know, did things that you shouldn't have done with the data set and, and said, well, forget bidding, I'll just, go, I'll yeah. just go stick the anomalies. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened. And they ultimately got caught at it and we succeeded. I mean, the I'm a big believer in the court system in, in, in first world jurisdictions, and we prevailed. And, and really, we defended Newmont's global CA, yeah, which tells me that CAs work. Mm-hmm. So did they make the discovery and then you were able to acquire or like the project was given back to you or, did, or was the project given back to you and then you Aqualine made the discovery? By the time we yeah. brought the um, legal action... I think they'd found the first two or 300 million ounces of silver. Interesting. And we yeah. subsequently more than doubled that resource. Yeah. And then it ultimately got sold with a number like, I want to say 700 million ounces of silver on it. My guess is now it's a billion ounces of silver. But I mean, it's another classic story in that there, there was a successful takeout by the developer, which thankfully we stepped off the, the train at that point in time because it's the project's still not been put into production for political and other other reasons around mm-hmm. around building mines. Like building mines, generally speaking, is just not easy. I mean, we'll speak about uranium mines. Building uranium mines is particularly yeah. challenging. So how did imagine. you structure the company initially? Did uh, you and, uh, I guess, the founders put together a shell knowing that you were going to bid on this asset? Or what was the actual inception of mm-hmm. Aqualine? It was a gold situation in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And we basically had a, a, you know, a situation that didn't work out to the to the degree that we thought, and we basically had to reposition. You're often cycling through assets in. Oh, you pivot all the time. Yeah, you're business. pivoting, yeah, yeah, in juniors, and so. All right. You know, basically, you can always get if the if the structure's decent, you can yeah. usually go get another get another asset and have a have another go at. So it. the people that stole um, the data and uh, staked the project were they a public company at the time? Yes, they were public. And then what what valuation did they hit before you were able to acquire? Oh, they they had a valuation in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. There was it was a seesaw the whole thing because there was lots of um, hedging strategies and what have you put on because really it was a kind of binary outcome ultimately in the mm-hmm. courts as to who owned the deposit. So that was I mean that whole thing was an interesting exercise and so I think yeah I don't want to say notoriety or whatever but there was a lot of there was a lot of chatter in the Times about it you know we were. We were castigated to some degree for being um, litigious or mm-hmm. or oriented that way, when in reality we really were just trying to def- defend what we had a- thought we had acquired. Yeah, and I think as in the fullness of time, I think people look back on it and said, you know, the the right party prevailed there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you yeah. won in in the court system, so. I but guess. you want to win in the court of public opinion ultimately as well. I mean, it's, yeah, well, I guess so. But yeah. I think in the end, people just remember how much money they made and they f- forget everything else. Or like, I don't, like when people bring up Aqualine, it was always about, I made money on it. Yeah, no, it was good. And I yeah. think it actually, we'll, we're going to talk about Laramide a little bit, but I yeah. I think they, a lot of people made, because these companies were going in parallel because the uranium 
the last big uranium cycle was was going on at the same time, and actually people made, in a lot of cases, a lot more money on laramide because laramide started at a penny. Oh yeah, and it went, and it went to sixteen dollars on the strength of, you know, we had the we had the mother of all uranium bull markets, largely because we had China basically going nuclear. Yeah, and and we had a market that really understood nothing about uranium because there hadn't been a bull market in anyone's lifetime. And, and you know, we, we created 700 companies before it was all done. And I think it started with less than 10. So yeah. you can kind of like uh, lithium right now. It's yeah. the most analogous thing I would yeah. say to it is lithium, except lithium is far, far more abundant, like yeah. the crustal abundance of lithium and the ease of finding a large amount of lithium. That's really not your challenge there. And so there's going to be, obviously, if it keeps going the way it's going, there'll ultimately be quite a bit of excess okay. supply. So before we um, move on to a different topic, I want to put a book into Aqualine. How much did you guys sell the company for and who bought it again? My, my recollection was that the, it was on the order of $650 million Canadian. It was bought by by Pan American Silver. Yeah. It was obviously the, the biggest silver company at the time and it's still one of the largest silver companies. Very good company, obviously. Yeah. Right? So I'm always interested. How, how did this come about? Like, did they approach you or did you guys meet at PDAC, like what, well, like, like any M and A scenario, we yeah. we we actually through the through the process of, um, you know, acquiring the deposit, because really the the court said hand over the keys effectively, and so we took over the operatorship halfway through the discovery process, and mm-hmm. as I said earlier, we expanded the deposit considerably. We had a you know we had a large team and everything else. We had a mystery major company in the register that we put in there at nine point nine percent. So there was tension. There was kind of tension in the whole thing already that it would probably result in some kind of an M and A outcome. So that precipitated it. There was a couple of other interested parties that were logical kind of buyers as well, and so there was there was M and A tension in the whole deal, and it ultimately resulted in quite you know quite a nice outcome. We actually had in the transaction structure, we were probably one of the first people that ever got a warrant as consideration for an acquisition, and because of the nature of the deposit, you know, getting developed and getting permitted and what have you, we actually got a unit in consideration for the... So or, they, they acquired you with shares? Yeah. I mean, a unit, and so yeah. the unit was made up of shares and a warrant? We had a five-year well. warrant. Do you make money on the warrant in, as well? No, so <laughs> <laughs> if I had to do it all over again, yeah. knowing how long everything takes in the mining business, I think I'd ask for a 10-year warrant. Yeah. And but as I said, it's still not permitted, so maybe yeah. that's not even long enough. So sometimes, you know, sometimes these things just... How, how old were you when you sold it? I don't know, 40s? Late 40s. In the 40s. And like after such a long ordeal going through the court system and exploring at the same time, because concurrently you were still working on what you had, right? Well, I just, we happen to be involved in a couple of other companies. Yeah. I think most people that are, you know, you interview lots of folks. I think yeah. very few just work on one, right? Very few people that do what I do work on just yeah. one thing or have one interest in one company, just because I think for long periods of time, that would be a very hard way to make a living. Yeah. Um, so you sort of have to have a few irons in the fire as it were. And we just happened to have a couple that got hot at the same time. And so that was a, you know, amazing flurry of activity How, during yeah. that decade. How did you celebrate the sale? Oh, well, like the way you'd have any, you know, we, we, we celebrated our victories. We had some nice parties, yeah, some <laughs> closing some, dinners yeah, and some, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Some peach. Oh, it, was, it was a good, no, it was a very good outcome. I mean, those kind of things are very good outcomes. I think a lot of shareholders that invest in these type of companies, I mean, in a lot of cases, that's really what they want to see the management do. They 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 start hearing about management wanting to build things, and they get a bit nervous. Yeah, yeah. So, but I do think, I mean, that's typically you got to do one or the other, and I think it depends on the situation that you're that you're in. Yeah, I wanna I wanna talk about another company that you were involved with, with and I think were you a founder or just a director of Con Resources, and where was that in the timeline? Like the whole Con fiasco that was after Aquiline. And how did you get in, involved with them? So Khan had, which it was K-H-A-N, yeah. you know, named after the famous Mongolian. Yeah. <laughs> so they had one of the largest deposits in, uranium. frankly, in the uranium space yeah. in Mongolia. And it was originally, you know, found, as it were, by the Russians. It was originally a source of supply for the Russians. And in what transpired after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the the breakup of the USSR, you know, Mongolia was a client state. And so all those kind of assets and similar thing happened in Kazakhstan, which mm-hmm. you could, if you recall with 
uranium one and those kind of things. Some of the better assets that really were developed by the Soviets came available and they ended up in Western public companies. That was one of them. We were very much trying to build up our asset base and, and we were very rigorous around things we looked at because we were only interested in things that really could produce in a decent place on the cost curve. And this con asset called Doornod in Mongolia, which was 50 plus million pounds, you know, met, met all those criteria. So we, we became the biggest shareholder of, of con in, I want to say like 2007, but this gives you a sense of the market. I think my recollection was we traded $9 Laramide paper for $4 con paper. And obviously, you know, post 08 and post Fukushima, yeah, those, those prices looked, you would have been quite happy if you'd sold that when that transaction happened just because of what happened to the uranium market itself. But it was an asset that was an important asset in the uranium space, and we were the largest shareholder. Got it. And then because drama follows you, that the asset was essentially taken away from Khan. Yeah, I don't I don't think I had much to do with it. <laughs> no, I'm just so, saying. A I'm short, not saying you did it. A short history yeah, of, just saying of, that. Of, yeah. of how we got in the uranium world to where we are today. You know, we yeah. had a massive boom mm -hmm. from, I want to say, 02 to certainly 08. That was all precipitated by the Chinese basically saying we're going nuclear and they were going to repeat what the Americans did in the 70s when the Americans built all of their power plants in the space of a decade and went to 20 percent nuclear because there was a big energy crisis in the United States. And so that drove a frenzy of people scrambling, looking for uranium. Where are we going to get the deposits? The price went from $7 a pound to ultimately $135 a pound, I think. Yeah. And then we had the first crack in the armor on the market was in 2008 when you had the GFC and, you know, Lehman fell apart and the whole world was going to fall apart. No one ever thought they could get 10 cents to build another nuclear plant. So it was really that that caused the, the first crack. And so I think the uranium price broke from something like 100 plus or 90 plus then down to 40. But there was a, another re like, like kind of um, a turnaround after that initial collapse where things started looking good again for uranium and then Fukushima happened, right? That totally derailed everything. Yes, what exactly? Yeah. So what happened in that intervening three-year period? Yeah. The Chinese, being very strategic and long-term oriented, said, we're building 60 giga power plants. We need fuel. It's on sale. They basically waded back into the market and started just buying up everything there was, just inventorying it. Yeah. And so they took the price back to $70. So the, the day before Fukushima happened, the uranium price was back at $70, which it hasn't seen since. We're, we're not there yet now. So they so were in the spot market buying They area. just bought every okay. pound they could get in the spot market because they had the demand. They were building plants. Yeah. And and then what happened is obviously we had this with, you know, everyone thought that was, uh, you know, to make a hockey analogy, we thought we were going to spend 12 or 18 months of the penalty box as an industry. Yeah. And it turned out to be 10 years in the mm -hmm. wilderness. And so, but I mean, you know, these, if it was a stock chart, the longer you go sideways, the more powerful you're going to get when you finally get the when you For finally sure. get the upturn. And so we're we're kind of at that moment now where we've had the little blip off the bottom, and we're really waiting for the proper. But let, let's market. go back to Con because this is in, in, interesting. So they had um, a great resource that was mined by the Russians, and the Russians came back and took it away, or like they made a deal with the Mongolians and took it away. So what yeah. happened was in this public company. Uh, an entrepreneur, a very well-known uranium entrepreneur named Wallace Mays was really the, the guy who went in there and, and sort of managed to secure the deposit. And he was kind of the founder of, of this company, Con, and really one of the more knowledgeable guys in the uranium business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and obviously quite a character. I think he had a young Mongolian wife and, you yeah. know, all the other side stories that go with these kind of mining stories. And so he ultimately managed to put a deal together that was a joint venture of this asset that was, I think it was 58% Khan, 21% Mongolia, government of Mongolia, 21% Raz Adam, which is basically yeah. the government of Russia. And in a weak moment, post the 08 thing, this is 09, at the very depth of the market, the, Ru the Russians came along and said, you know, we don't like partners. How about, how about we buy you out at X? Yeah. And, you know, X wasn't very favorable. And so the company decided in their wisdom that they would have a bidding war and get the Chinese involved. And then that's when the real kind of skullduggery happened. And before you know it, the licenses were stripped and then we ended up with nothing. 
and had to sue the government of Mongolia to get our money back, which we actually successfully did. It took a number of years, went through international arbitration. Yeah. And the company got back, you know, I think we sued for 300 and something million. But we were awarded 100 and we settled at 70 uh, U.S., I think it was. So that was – that was a very hard way to get your money back. I don't recommend that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's sort of a, it's not an atypical mining story. And I, you know, we'll probably talk about it a little bit now, but you see what's happening in Niger. Yeah. You know, that to me has shades, elements of that kind of activity that could be in prospect. So do you think um, companies that are operating in Niger have, is there a risk that the government can take away their projects from them? Oh, I think you've got all. I mean, there's always the risk when you operate the range in of risk there now like that. But is, now, yeah. yeah, even beyond that, as far as will the assets operate? Because it's a landlocked country. I mean, that, people forget about that with Mongolia too. Mongolia is a landlocked country. Kazakhstan is a landlocked country. So when you're talking about uranium, the number one thing you got to be thinking about first and foremost, especially if you're a Western company, is you got to move it out somehow. Mm-hmm. And you're not flying it out, so you got to get it out by rail or by road, or, and so that that with what's happening now, it's way too early to say what is going to transpire in this situation. In most cases, in countries where, you know, a big chunk of their GDP is related to resource development or something, they're, you know, they're going to need to operate the assets. So the assumption is they're going to operate the assets at some point in time in the future, and it's it's the uranium for France Inc. So obviously, yeah. it matters a lot to France. It matters a lot to Europe. The question is, though, are, are they still going to be the owners? I have no doubt that uranium will get produced there in the fullness of time, but I, I can't tell you who the owners are. I mean, in the case of Dornod, to the best of my knowledge, in Mongolia, you know, they stripped the asset and then never did anything with it. So, so it's still sitting there. So they took away the asset in the hopes of securing, I guess, supply for Russia, and they haven't done anything with it yet. Like, where else would the uranium gone? Oh, I guess they didn't want to go to... They didn't want it to go down to China, right? Because the infrastructure is there to... Well, you just don't know what happens because, you know, life intervenes, Mm. (laughs) you know. And so this was 09. By the time the whole takeover fell apart, because we we managed to get the Chinese government to come and bid over the top of the Russians. Yeah. And then managed to get nothing. We had two superpowers bidding for our project and ended up with a donut. Yeah. And had to get the money back in court. So... Lots of strange things can happen, but then in 2011, it was March 2011, you had Fukushima, so any any need to develop new sources of uranium supply kind of went out the window because the market suddenly was an oversupply from, you know, 2012 on. And so it's taken a long time. What's happening now? I fully suspect that asset will get developed now. I mean, we're in a case now where everything that's plausibly can get developed is going to have to get developed because the the supply shortfall is that big. Yeah, it's slow moving because it's nuclear power and it's gigantic, large scale capex power plants, right? Mm-hmm. So it takes time, but I mean, once once the demand switches on, it's on, and it's you know, once it switches on with one of these new plants, you got sixty years of demand. Yeah, and I know, yeah. and I know that um, I I think it's because uranium has been so stagnant for the longest time, but people forget how violent the torque is when. When this commodity moves, it moves harder and faster than any other commodity out there because you have a good analog is, I guess, when China had to go in and started buying everything on the spot market and they they took everything out, and especially with a lot of mines shut down because nothing has been economic, when that move does happen and people start trying to secure um, uranium, I think we're going to see a hard move, but... I've been saying this for a while, but I think something is going to give now, and I think you can agree with me that it fundamentally it looks like a, a slingshot pointed to the moon right now. But what, what what's going to make it move? Yeah, everybody says that because obviously, the, and there's so many people and so many sort of deep contrarians and I everything mean, that love this trade because analytically, it has to work. But what you yeah. don't know is when the timing is going to be, and typically yeah. you make all your money on, like you said, these slingshot moves or or a. Um, step change move in the market. And I do think that's what's going to happen from this level we're at now, which is what, just below 60. Yeah. You know, so what's the next step change? Is it going to be 70, 75? And what happens is someone really has to be on the other side of the trade that isn't retail. It's really got to be the utilities. So it's a strange market because the utilities all know all, all the same. They know more than us, but they're in no rush and they seem to play chicken with the market. And then they seem to grudgingly accept that, okay, it's 75, we'll pay 75. Yeah. And so that's been, in my experience of dealing with, you know, having conversations with the utilities as long as I've been in Laramide, 
you know, they very begrudgingly in the last cycle finally admitted that, okay, we'll pay 50. We're, uh, we don't really like paying $50 a pound, but we'll pay 50. The new price is 50. So that kind of became the benchmark when things started flirting up with 50 as they would walk away and they would try and get cheap pounds somewhere else. And so yeah. they're, they're just sort of not going to have a chance. And it's a bit of a lemming scenario where the, the, someone will make the move and some utility will, will set the bar higher. And then they basically all have to pay. And it's sort of being a bit like being a fund manager where you don't really want to track the index, but if everyone's doing it and you're losing, eventually you cave. Mm. And it's that kind of dynamic that's probably going to happen. And I think we're quite close to that point now. I mean, we just had Cameco had their numbers out this week and they have a, you know, that's a very good earnings call. I would recommend people that like to follow Uranium, you know, get, just get the transcript of their earnings call and get to get some, if you want to sort of deeper dive into what the, the biggest producers thinking and everything else. And they gave some interesting contract information which they're seeing the terms of, of business in these contracts now move to really what are – it's really a seller's market. And so what happens in a seller's market is you get hard floors and, and sort of flexible ceilings. And the floors now that they are basically saying is the market today is kind of a $50 number at a floor and, and you're seeing an $80 you – know, the utilities won $80 ceilings. You know, that tells you we're probably going to see $80. Yeah. Yeah. In the spot. Well, in the market generally, yeah. probably ultimately in the contract market. Yeah. I mean, that's a start. Yeah. You know, but a big company has to, they can't wait around for the perfect condition to start layering in contracts. Well, what are they signing the long-term contracts Contracts for right now? Well, see, they don't. The, they don't. That's sort of the industry that, right? trade secret and everything's an NDA. The information gets sort of reported fact as far as what con contract prices are. But contract prices are acknowledged now to be certainly probably in the 50s, maybe mm -hmm. the high 50s. Mm -hmm. And every study that's done by a developer now is not using a number less than 65. And I think nobody is balking at, at people saying your project's going to work at 65 and you're going to get 65. So numbers like that are clearly probably coming. Now, what gets people excited though is when you, like you said, you get this slingshot move or you get this torque. And so that's what a lot of the people are in the trade for, I think, particularly the, the hedge fund types. So because uranium has not fully taken off yet, and if, let's say, you're a retail investor just getting to know the space, what kind of companies should these people be looking at? Something in production first, I imagine, and then as uranium goes up, kind of, kind of the same scale as what you follow any other commodity look at the developers and then go to more towards some more riskier explorers or yeah, that's you, a great, you want a basket of everything in Well, there? that's a great question. So first of all, I think the interesting thing about uranium and why you should, you know, pay, pay attention to it, care about it, it has the benefit of, of being what I call a thematic. So, you know, it's not, it's not really an asset class like gold, but it's, if AI is a thematic, you get all the stuff that goes with being a thematic. So you get money flows and you get interest and eyeballs and everything else. And it's its own thematic because of nuclear. But it's also in this other thematic called energy because it's kind of joined at the hip a little bit with the rest of the energy complex. So when you have a good energy market, you also tend to get interest in it and flows in it and everything else. And there's a whole bunch of – because it's a thematic, yeah. you've got a whole bunch of vehicles that have developed for ways for investors to play the space. So they – there's a number of these vehicles that basically have aggregated physical pounds where you're effectively just buying the the NAV equivalent of a bunch of pounds sitting in a warehouse. And so you get whatever the delta is on that change of the price. And that's probably the, you know, that's a low risk way to play it with, you know, obviously pretty good upside if you think the price is going higher. The 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 next best leverage is obviously in the companies. Now there's ETFs that have baskets of uranium companies some of which are torquier because they have more companies like ours in it. And then obviously you can buy the companies themselves and there's, you know, like any resource um, vertical, there's producers. And But in uranium, weirdly enough, there's very few producers. There's only a couple of com public company producers that actually produce anything. And then, you know, one is Kaz, Kaz Adam Prom, mm -hmm. which for whatever reason, it's a very good company and lists in London, pays a big dividend. But some people are averse to that. You have Cameco, which obviously is a big, always been the big girl of public company in the market. And then it's very far down from there before you get companies that, frankly, right now aren't producing. And if they produce what they say they're going to produce, it's not a lot of production. In a lot of cases, a million or two million pounds a year. So that's the range. And then you have companies like ours that have the promise of bigger development assets 
if and when the various issues that they need to get into production are resolved, and they tend to trade it at bigger discounts, but the the valuation floor is basically the fact that you own a lot of serious pounds in the ground in good places that are going to have to get produced one. Do you think that, like, I, I always compare it to the other commodities in mining sector, but when one of the signs that potentially that we've hit the bottom is you see some consolidation, some M&A activity. Do you think that we're going to see more consolidators in the space first before we see it kind of uh, taking off again? Or has that been done? Like everything, all the all the companies that should have been acquired are acquired, and now we're just waiting for higher prices? Yeah, the consolidation thing is a tough one in uranium because unlike in, let's say, gold, where you have a you know, a very organized, stratified industry with mid-tiers and majors and junior producers and exploration companies. You know, in the in the uranium market, as an acquirer, a, a, a logical acquirer, you got Cameco, yeah. <laughs> really. And so, and Cameco is very focused on Saskatchewan primarily. And, and they're really not, you know, if these talk about, are they going to buy something in Africa or something? Very unlikely. And so you just don't have that natural thing. The other thing you have is you basically have um, mergers of equals and things to create bigger, bulkier companies. That has some potential, particularly amongst maybe the ISR players in the United States or something like that, where they, you have a couple of companies that each have about a million pounds a year or something. You just want to make it bigger yeah. or relevant. Some of that's possible, but I don't see – I mean the big one that everyone's hoping for is that someone's going to come in and – and by next gen, obviously, and somehow everyone's going to make a lot of money on that. But again, you're back to Cameco, and yeah, maybe they will, but they have they have alternatives. And do you think a Rio or BHP? Would this, there were some bigger. See, Rio and BHP were Rio in particular was in the uranium business. I would say Rio has got halfway out of the uranium business at least, maybe more. Um, you know, they're rumored to be more interested in being in clean energy and lithium and things like that, yeah. uh, mainly because there's Isn't more scale. Isn't uranium considered clean energy, though? 100 percent. But the, the issue with the, the issue with the uranium business itself is even when Rio was in the business as a meaningful player in the business, the aggregate revenue to them of the uranium division, if you will, is very small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just not meaningful enough. BHP's kind of inadvertently in the uranium business because they own Olympic Dam, which has a bunch of uranium in it. But the uranium in Olympic Dam, it's 70 ppb, right? I mean, it's byproduct, really. Yeah. They just are very good at processing technology, and they capture it all, and they sell 10-plus million pounds a year. But they, 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 they wouldn't – I don't think they would tell you that they're in the uranium business. And so they're not really considered to be kind of a logical acquirer. For a while, there was some rumors around uh, tech having an interest in it in the uranium business because one of the quirks in the Canadian system is that uh, no foreigner can own more than 49% of a, of a uranium deposit. So that rules out China, right? So China has their – they have their fingerprints on those couple of new things on the west side of the Athabasca in one way or another. But they're not perceived to be the, 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 the buyer of the whole asset and because, of the, because of the legislation. But, I mean, could I, see a, could I see a consortium type scenario for those things? Those projects on the west side in particular like the next gen and I think fission and – those those projects. I mean, we're talking billion dollar type projects. So you know, a consortium's not an unusual. The oil business does that kind of thing when they're into big offshore uh, yeah. oil oil developments. Yeah. You know, you have partners, and it's quite common. It's less common in mining, but it, it, this situation would lend itself to that. So that's one possible scenario that you see. And I think, in a way, the market because everybody knows there's this shortfall in the uranium market. And I think one of the big overhangs in the market is the the new projects in Saskatchewan, the nature of those projects, they, they can't come out of the ground incrementally. They kind of – because of the nature of them, they're super high capex and very high grade. And and the way the studies have been designed, and it may not work that way, but you know they, they have a study where they're going to make 30 million pounds the first year. Well, that's probably really not going to happen. But even if it's 15 to 20, you really have to have a plan for how you're going to get that into the market. And I think yeah. the market could be more interesting – Frankly, after we have that, if there's an event that says, okay, here's how the West Side is coming into the market in the next 10 or 15 years, and all the models get built, and and everyone realizes, well, we're still short. <laughs> and so, you know, that may be the that may be the final leg of the uranium market, because I think we're going to have this, That's, as we talked about yeah. earlier, this, this next leg up from whatever it was, because we've already seen 65 this cycle. We had a huge move off the bottom, 25 to 65, back to 45. We're 50s now. 
I mean, the next move, I don't know where it's going, but probably higher than the first move. And then, you know, we saw it before. The, the market in that last cycle went to a crazy number. Yeah. I don't like... So y- you run Laramide, and you mentioned that from pennies. How high did it get to? $16. 16 was, bucks. Yeah. And do you think that once a company has reached a valuation that high, it can regain a valuation that high in the next cycle? Or is it... Um, or or does it have to be a new company that holds that asset or, you know, or like, or, or do people know they don't want to recycle the same project or company again, or it, that doesn't matter what's in the oh, ground. Uh, like in situ, in situ value is what it's worth. Well, I, I, first of all, we're, we're not the same company because there's incremental assets that are in there that weren't in there before. Frankly, there was a, the whole U S part of the company is much more substantial than it was in the last cycle. And, you know, if you're talking about, Price per share, that's very unlikely because all these companies, you know, you're, you're not getting through 10 years without dilution. And so, yeah, can we get back to that kind of valuation where it's five, six, seven hundred million? I think pretty easily if you put a number on it. I mean, yeah. we, you have a hundred million pounds. Can, can we trade at five or six or seven dollars a pound? I think you can. There's companies that are trading there now. Yeah. So, you know, part of our issue is we just have we'd be farther along. We have a big political challenge because we're in one particular state in Australia that at the moment says they don't want to do uranium, but they're not the permanent government of Queensland, Australia. So at some point, the other party will be in as they were in in 2012. So we had the misfortune of having the other party that was pro-uranium development in for three years when the uranium price was $20. Are you going to sue the government again? No. We- <laughs> you seem to have... Uh- no, no, no. no. We- <laughs> I was just joking. No. No, um, we're tr- we're yeah. trying we're trying to that to hope that they come to the the, the decision on is, their own. That's an interesting yeah. case. Is, though, is that in the, on the western side of Australia? No, Where? it's in, it's it's uh, on the east coast, Queensland. Queensland is having that same. I heard the it's hard to do things in in West Australia. As Queensland well. and Western Australia. Yeah. It's quir- it's a quirk of their domestic politics. To be honest, it's really all about elections and electoral politics mm-hmm. and the Green Party and really basically trying to trying to capture the platform of the Green Party to not lose votes to the Green Party. Yeah. It, it, well, I'm hoping it's an anachronism that's going away because a lot of the Green Parties in the world now, frankly, because of the issues around climate and everything else, and and honestly, just the shortage of energy, and especially cheap energy, you know, nuclear is really having a moment. I mean, you're seeing the, you know, we're sitting here in Ontario. I mean, I don't, I'm in the business of, of you know, nuclear to some degree, and I, nobody got any heads up in Ontario that they were going to go, oh, let's build four more gig at, of nuclear power at Bruce. They just sprung that on the population out of nowhere. Yeah. So uh, how many pounds does Laramide have in the ground right now? hundred? A uh, hundred plus, yeah. hundred plus. And, yeah. and uh, what's your market cap right now? Around a hundred million. There's really? two big, there's two big kind of, you know, it's a barbell thing. There's a big 50 million pound ISR thing, which is a particular technology in the United States. Mm-hmm. And there's 50 million pound more to what you consider a traditional mine, open pit mine, traditional processing. It's in in Queensland, awesome. uh, Australia. Yeah. yeah, and that and both, and particularly in the one in Australia, we're drilling there now. There's scope now for that to get to get bigger. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, worrying about it. Obviously, when you're in the wilderness for 10 years and the price is 20 dollars, yeah. but we're kind of back doing all the things you do as a proactive company in the anticipation that you know, this is going to go this cycle and let's, let's get ready. Yes. Yeah, so in the last cycle, what was, I guess, the, the average, if you like, this is a very general metric to use, but the, uh, like, let's say dollar per pound, like when Laramide was 16 bucks, what was uh, the dollar per pound? Well, I think you got to numbers between five and $10 a pound. Five and 10. So mm-hmm. in the next cycle, ideally, or hopefully we can hit five to 10 pounds again, but I think um, what you mentioned before, if you've been stagnant for 10 years, typically, and I think this has been proven historically as well, when you look at any other commodity cycle, normally the bulls that run after large bear markets are twice as hard and twice as long. So I think, like I'm hoping that for gold, and I can really see that for uranium as well, just because the fundamentals are a little bit different, but people need uranium. They're going to need it to fuel the plants and stuff like that, so... Oh, yeah, it's energy. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. core, it's very much core. And as I said, it's thematic. And so the other thing you have going for it, the market cap of the whole sector is tiny. Mm-hmm. I think the market cap of the whole sector is something like $30 billion. And so, you know, there were days in the last month 
when some of the magnificent seven, you know, the the that all mentioned AI four hundred times in their conference calls, the you know the Microsofts and the you know the big cap trillion dollar market cap companies, like they they their market caps went up interday more than the entire market cap of the, yeah. of the uranium business. And you know, listen, AI is interesting. It's promising. We need you know, do we need it? I suppose it'll be good to have it. I'm pretty sure we need the 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 companies that are producing uranium and, and nuclear power. You know, you've made a lot of commitment to it already. There's 450 some plants already, right? And more coming. So, yeah, it's a, it's more of a case where the public really has to to sort of the light goes on, and then so yeah. I think, but I think the potential for a lot of flow to go into a sector that's very small. And that already has these vehicles that are actually designed, if you will, to capture flow, like both the physical vehicle, the Sprott and the Yellow Cake, and these ETFs. And there's, you know, the ETF has, I think one of them has about 1.6 billion under under management. The Sprott vehicles have over a billion under management. You know, can you see those vehicles having pretty quickly, t if the public yeah, if the generalists As a moment come in. and the generalists come in, can those things be at two billion in a hurry? I think they probably can. I feel like they'd, as a commodity, it's easier to understand uranium than gold. But I think, um, and I mentioned this uh, in the past, it, this cycle is a little bit different because there's a lot of people buying into uranium, uh, nuclear power as a very viable green source of, like the, the, this wave and that you don't have as big of much of that NIMBY attitude as well, especially if you have Bill Gates and Elon Musk telling this newer generation that this this is the cleanest form and safest form of power to go, and this is our future. So I'm really excited to to see that wave of younger generalists come in and see what really happens to this sector. If you're saying that it's only $30 billion, like what it's not going to take a lot to move it. No, and I actually do think, and I think the fact that they're talking about um, some new technology, even though it's, and there is some new technology, but the SMR, the SMR mm -hmm. technology, I think has captured people's uh, imagination a little bit. And so I think they're giving it all a fresh look. I think that's been helpful to people s sort of having an honest conversation about all forms of energy and how are we going to make it in the future and everything else. And I think nuclear comes off very well when you, when you, when you have that kind of, um, objective discussion about, your alternatives. And so I think we're going through a moment like that. And I think it's very helpful that the younger generation is, seems to be very much in favor of it in most yeah. jurisdictions. Very cool. Do you have any closing remarks or do you want to touch on anything else that we missed, Mark? I think, uh, I think we covered a fair bit of, fair bit of ground there. Yeah. Obviously I think it's a space that you want to watch. I think obviously our company bears watching as well. And we're, I would say we're one of a small number. We didn't really touch on that, but when we talked about how small the, the market cap of the group is, if you will, mm -hmm. I mean, just to use these ETFs as an example, and I would say those ETFs really prominently capture most of the companies that matter in the space. And I, I'm guessing there's not more than 25 or 30 names in like <laughs> those ETFs. So if you're going to go hunting for individual names, I would certainly, that would be your, you know, your starting point for research to go there. And I think we stack up pretty well just in terms of deep discount evaluation, just because of the quirks around what it's, what it's, how long it's going to take to get our stuff developed and the few little obstacles we got in our way, right? The majority of the weighting in those ETFs that were going to be geared, to, geared towards the producers though. Right. Well, yeah, yeah but a, yeah. as I said, there are there's only two of them. Yeah, so, so so they actually took interestingly they took Kaz Adam Prom for whatever reason, even though it's probably the biggest producer, obviously by far. They sort of I don't know whether it's a political calculation or whatever, but Cameco has the top weighting, and I think Kaz Adam Prom would be the next biggest weighting. And those two, in the particularly in the Sprott one, which doesn't put you know nuclear reactor vendors and people like that in there, I think they. They have a whole formula that I think caps the two biggest producers at about 40. So there's a lot of room amongst the rest of the group. And I think what's happening in the group, because when you really get down to the group of who's got a deposit that's advanced, that's got a study that if the permits came in the mail tomorrow, they would go start building it because the conditions are favorable and the economics work. That's a group of less than 20 names. Yeah, And we've seen... In the last month, we've seen four of those names have hiccups. 
you know, two of which are in Niger, which I mean, they're maybe hopefully they're just market hiccups at the moment and they're going to carry on and they'll produce. And so there's some jockeying around. And as I said, like there isn't a hundred names to choose from. It's not like gold or copper or. Yeah, lithium. I think yeah. Uh, before when we we're kind of setting uh, the framework for this talk, you mentioned that in the last cycle, there was over a thousand issuers in the uranium space. And now what are we down to? Well, I think it peaked out at about 700 on, you know, ASX, TSX, yeah. the London exchanges. I think one of the reasons that happened was because the public had zero knowledge of uranium going in. So anybody that could plausibly say, I, hey, I have a uranium project and some oil company drilled three holes here in 1974. Yeah. So all, and there was no Google before I think 2004. Yeah. So this bull market started right, you know, at the advent of Google. So the knowledge base of the public was very low <laughs> and a lot of companies got created that, you know, probably shouldn't have got created. And they ran a lot of stuff, old stuff up the flagpole that probably didn't deserve to get run up the flagpole. And at the end of that process, you've winnowed that 700 names, I would say back to 20 or 30 names. When I used to dub it the survivor group, we survived Fukushima, we were in that group and you had a real deposit. Yeah. And so, and everybody's super knowledgeable now because you can check out the provenance of one of these assets in five seconds on Google. So that you're not going to have the same proliferation of companies that you had before. I do think though, and it's maybe it's with the next wave up in the market. We're, we're going to have a greenfield exploration cycle in uranium that we haven't had. We really didn't have that in the last cycle. We really just went and drilled holes into things we already mostly knew about. Yeah. With the exception of the next gen and a couple of others. And I think we're, we're ripe for having a cycle with um, more expert, kind of yeah, like what we're seeing. Generative with, with, exploration. Like, and like actually, with lithium right now. you know, let's throw some AI in there because I guarantee you, but if we have that. There'll be these expiration juniors talking about how much AI they're going to put at this because we're really short of uranium and we got to go find it. Mm. And so, and you know, we don't really want to find it in probably in Niger or Kazakhstan. We want to find it somewhere where we're a little more comfortable. Yeah. Or, you know, let's find it in countries that aren't landlocked maybe to start. Yeah. You know, so I, I could see that kind of a cycle happening. We're not quite there yet because people aren't that enthusiastic yet, but you know, you, you, you follow all this, you know, the business you're in that you have companies that are involved in that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's probably, it's, it's probably coming to a yeah, well, it's, you. It's going to come, it's going to yeah. come hard. So I can't wait. Mm -hmm. Um, I like what we covered today. It was, uh, a very interesting conversation and, you know, thanks for get thanks again for swinging by on short notice as well. So no, I really no, appreciate, I appreciate you having you. I always love to have a chat. Yeah. <laughs> it was really fun. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. and uh, thanks, James. Thanks, CJ.